All right, welcome to the district attorney's portion of the um, 2025 council budget hearings. Um, um, district attorney Sims, if you would please provide an over overview of your office, um, specifically number of employees, the people served, the programs, and um, your future plans. Okay. Well, I'm going to let Jennifer touch on the no total number of employees first, and then I'll pick up from there. Was it 88, 87? 14. Oh, from both divisions. From both, yeah. Okay. We currently have 114 employees in St. Tammany Parish and 19 in Washington Parish. Within the criminal division, the office is responsible for prosecuting violations of state statute uh, that occur in St. Tammany and Washington Parishes, as well as the city courts in uh, East, well, the East St. Tammany Court, uh, which includes Slidell and Bogalusa City Court. Uh, which includes all traffic violations, misdemeanors, um, juvenile offenses, uh, felonies, worthless checks, so forth and so on. The attorney's office is responsible for all stages of prosecution from screening through appeals process. Uh, prosecution, we also conduct uh, our own independent investigations through the grand jury system uh, in both processes um, and have a series of investigative relationships um, both in uh, statewide uh, and federal and at the local municipality levels uh, as well. Uh, as of September 30th, uh, 2024, the office has charged uh, 2,384 uh, defendants with felony uh, grade violations, which puts the office on pace to exceed the number of cases in 2023, which was about 3,005. Um, compared to, which is always a point to compare, that's a, uh, a difference from 2,678 at the end of 2014. Um, so this seems to be our new norm of number of defendants uh, charged per year. I mean, slight upticks, I think you'll continue to have those. Um, I've submitted most of all of this in writing uh, to you. Um, the office separate and apart, and just stop me if I'm going on too much as to the overview of the office. In addition to traditional prosecutions, Again, those stretch over 10 uh, felony divisions of court. Um, in St. Tammany, which is different than other jurisdictions, we have uh, in the St. Tammany side, we have one major uh, misdemeanor division of court as opposed to all the misdemeanors being assigned to each judge in particular. They rotate to handle all the entire misdemeanor docket, which includes your domestics. Um, in Slidell, just as something unique, um, Slidell passed ordinances that mirrored the revised statute violations for non-enhanceable uh, misdemeanors uh, or misdemeanors that didn't need enhancement. So some of the cases that we traditionally used to handle, we don't. Um, it was a financial thing. They wanted to not share some of the revenues with the larger parish and it wasn't necessary, but we had an agreement that we would retain all the domestic violence cases because it had a little bit additional expertise that I don't think they were equipped to handle, which I think at the time was about 84 domestic violence cases a year we still retained. Um, we can absorb plenty of volume on the misdemeanor side, whether it be in Slidell or whether it be in St. Tammany as a whole. A thousand, it sounds crazy, but 500 cases here and there, a thousand tickets doesn't really change the staffing level in needs. We can absorb uh, in both locations uh, more volume. Um, what is different that we do do and we have built over the years is our special victims unit for sex crimes, which is highlighted in what I've submitted. Um, it has allowed us to perform uh, forensics uh, for our own cases and to assist all the municipalities that can't afford to hire a expert forensic uh, examiner. Uh, for us, that's Brian Brown. We presently share his salary with Covington uh, PD. It's not ideally how we want it to be. Uh, we'd like to have that be a, a full-time position that we're not sharing a portion of his freight with another agency to further make him more available uh, to the entire parish as a whole because he has general uh, investigative responsibilities with um, Covington PD that takes him away from a, I guess, a higher capacity of doing a deep dive. We find that when he's involved in forensics on child exploitation cases, uh, we're detecting more hands-on involvement, more production involvement, a case that seems to be merely possession of child pornography for a deeper dive that he has the expertise and time to do. He's an expert that goes all over the state, used to teach it and, has t and teaches it out of the state. Um, he uh, exploits the potential of what the cases could and should be if you had the time. 
So that's a, a very important component. Um, in addition to that, we have a dedicated uh, child exploitation uh, prosecutor um, that is also able to be brought in at the early uh, investigative screening phase in conjunction with uh, the investigative teams. Um, he handles more of the major cases and follows them. He's out of a division of court, so he follows the major cases. Most oftentimes, if we can, he'll handle it from investigative phase all the way through completion, which people would call that vertical prosecution of those types of cases. Um, but in addition to that, Eson Bolin uh, and Ronnie Grashnet kind of uh, finish out the special victims unit of screening and reviewing cases. Both of those prosecutors have 30 to 25 years but, uh, each. Um, so you have a very experienced unit that's been built for these homicides, uh, child exploitation cases, um, and uh, we've had great success. We've got about a, I think you've, most, some of you attended the uh, uh, Men Who Cook, Heroes Who Cook last night. Between our organization and theirs, there's a special way we handle uh, child exploitation cases through a multidisciplinary team process. Um, this unit allows us to embed with them and we have kind of like you guys are seated right now. That's how every case of reported abuse is presented amongst Children's Hospital, um, our office, the investigative agency, DCFS, um, the clinicians who are treating the kids to try to get them back to, um, from, to a post uh, PTSD posture. Uh, we sit and talk about every single case regardless of an arrest. So that unit participates in that process and leads that process as well. I think we have approximately, I'm going to glance at this, uh, it's like 279 uh, at the beginning of the year, correct me if I'm wrong, 279 sex crimes that were pending trial. And it looks like we've resolved as a time of that this case, that this was submitted, approximately 97 cases had been resolved in 2024. So we're making a dent in those cases. If you look at our press releases, you'll see regularly, these are the cases we're going to trial on, murders case, murder cases, rape cases, child exploitation cases. I think the 10%, the 15% of our trials are the nonviolent uh, thefts, uh, drug cases, and whatnot. Uh, usually we're able to resolve a lot of those cases. We have about 100 trial opportunities to go to trial per year uh, based upon a court calendar that's different. Some judges, Judge LaBella, who just walked in as one, uh, will give us extra dates at times to um, some cases that won't plead, that take a little bit more time, a little extra complex, separate apart from those regular dates so that we don't waste, it's not a waste of a date, uh, but you're trying to move bulk and volume. So sub 3,100 felons per year, 100 opportunities to go to trial per year. You have to be very efficient in moving that docket, otherwise you get overwhelmed, which is what we saw during COVID when we had to shut down. I think the first time I stood before you several years ago um, when our budget had been reduced that triggered a lawsuit, um, it was the result of receiving less money that we had received a couple years prior to coming out of COVID with almost twice as many cases pending trial after we were shut down. So a lot of that we have uh, kind of eaten into that backlog and handled the new volume. So instead of having a high of 2,100 cases pending trial, I think we may be below 1,800 or in the 1,800s cases pending trial with that new volume. So if you can appreciate over the last several years handling two additional criminal divisions worth of cases is if Judge LaBella was reproduced twice. So we had 10 divisions of court. If we had 12, that's what we're handling in 10 divisions of court right now as far as your felony uh, caseload with that backlog that we ate into. So I think between the judiciary and us, we've done a very good job um, both handling the additional volume with the same number of divisions and eating into the backlog. The backlog comprised of more of these major cases, right? So the sex cases, the cases that no one who knew we would, couldn't go to trial was never going to take a plea deal. So if you're going to jail, they were going to wait us out. So we had to handle those. Next is the opioid initiative that we, uh, we've started. In 2023, the parish saw 116 overdose deaths. Um, I think the year before that it was 120 something. Um, so that seems to be your neighborhood of, of what you're of what you're seeing over the last two to three years, 121, 120, 116. Um, up until recently, most of those were not being worked as a homicide. We've kind of changed that. Um, we have a, a gentleman named Daryl Marsev that we hired. Um, a lot of his salary is paid for by the opioid settlement grant monies, not grants, but the opioid settlement monies. Um, Washington Parish is contributing 
remind me? 50,000. 50,000. St. Tammany is contributing? 45,000. 45,000 um, to that program. Um, so uh, we may revisit that at some point. I think that's that, that kind of came up recently. We were asked to resubmit some information regarding that. Um, that's critically important to what we're doing. Right now, we have more cooperation amongst the municipalities and outside parish agencies than you've ever seen. Your, your opioid heroin dealer that's sitting in Slidell, uh, not to say his name, but the gentleman was uh, at a barbershop slinging meth. This isn't an opioid case, it'll be a meth case example. Um, his entire stash house was located in New Orleans East. Um, so coordinated effort between Slidell PD, our office, FBI in New Orleans uh, Special Operations Division, you have five pounds of meth taken out uh, of play out of his stash house that's stuck in New Orleans. That doesn't happen without the coordination of multiple agencies. Uh, so a guy where there's a lack of law enforcement presence in New Orleans East can't just hide his stash and we're stuck with grams. Uh, that's a waste of time. Uh, we've recently had cases where 5,000 open yard pills have come off the streets um, through, again, coordinated efforts between us DEA, Tangibahoa. Um, we have supplemented with uh, Mandeville, Slidell, Covington. Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office has now cross designated in with us. They are giving us assets and financial resources through um, software programs that are being provided out of parish through none of your dollars, but to us through this cooperative effort. Um, DEA is paying some of our guys overtime monies to again in bed with them and work on cases that impact our communities from a much larger scale no cost to you guys uh, most of the opioid initiative has not cost you the taxpayers or representatives of the taxpayers any money other than the settlement funds which were a, uh, a nine year i think 18 to nine years depending on how you double up those funds um, and i think uh, we're seeing the benefits of that uh, we are charging uh, that we've charged at least three three homicides over the last year now um, for opioid related uh, deaths. We're going to continue to uh, ramp that up. There's one in in Mandeville we're working presently, um, so I think you will expect to see that as we track them. We're going to put an asterisk so that you understand um, that the ov overall homicide rate for traditional homicides is not increasing, but we'll have a separate asterisk to track the ones that we're charging for opioids. I think most people would want to know that, oh, geez, our homicide rate isn't going out of control, but this is something that's not been worked and something that's not traditionally worked uh, throughout the state. Um, so until this happened, I think over the last several years of the, I'm going to add two years together, 200 and something opioid overdose deaths, one was worked as a homicide. So I think it's important to change that. Um, major offense unit, again, uh, what we do differently is that within two weeks, of arrests for major cases, uh, life offenses or otherwise, law enforcement meets with us um, before uh, a charging decision has been made. We make sure we have a very good work product at the conclusion. We also consult and make it available that even without an arrest, law enforcement can communicate with us and seek guidance as well. Obviously in here I've also outlined our specialty courts which are primarily uh, grant funded uh, but also supplemented with uh, I think volunteer time from all agencies involved to include the judiciary, district attorney's office, I imagine the clerk's office as well. The worthwhile program will continue to do that. Um, our diversion program looks to identify uh, first time nonviolent offenders to try to rehabilitate them, put them in specialty courts, not specialty courts, but specialty programs. We have MOUs with North Shore Technical Community College to try to get vocational training for a lot of these guys. For those that are involved in our specialty courts, at times we incentivize them um, if they are willing to go get a vocation or trade, we'll actually offer them a misdemeanor instead of a felony if they go continue uh, through that process and we'll retain jurisdiction over the cases for that purpose. Our child support division, uh, depending on, there's a, uh, a federal review of non-support um, programs in each district attorney's office every year. Uh, depending on the category, we're either one, two, or three. Uh, ranked first in the state, second in the state, or third in the state for different efficiencies that we've uh, created in those programs to include the dollars that we collect. I think we collected about 19 million. Um, almost 20 million. Almost 20 million um, in uh, non-support last year, or failure of people to pay child support. So critical program um, and <clears throat> do a phenomenal job. 
and always have. And obviously, you guys know we also run the civil department, which you're intimately familiar with. You guys run the budget um, for those things. Is that enough of an overview? So. Okay. All right. Questions, <coughs> Mr. Cool. Uh, DA, thank you for coming. And thank you, you know, over the last several months when we've been having public discussions, I mean, one of the main reasons people live in St. Tammany Parish is for security and safety. And one of the points I tried to make at the last meeting was sometimes you don't even think about it because you're so used to expecting it here, but you know that that could change overnight if, uh, you know, if, if we don't have the standard that you're providing now. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask, and I, um, I talked a little bit uh, to the coroner about this, uh, the they had talked about they're gonna have to hire a forensic pathologist and that uh, is, is it your position that you were then he is I'm understanding is the, the coroner has the qualifications but your position is that you would re you would require an outside forensic pathologist to, to be used in any prosecutions or uh, legal work is that correct I'll say it differently there's a there's been conversations between the two agencies and it's my understanding that the coroner will have a outside, not outside, but he will hire a pathologist to do the pathology work uh, for his agency. Uh, traditionally, over the last probably, I guess, at least two coroners, the coroner himself has not engaged in doing the pathology work. Um, what's unique in this particular coroner is that the other ones were not certified um, pathologists to be able to do um, that work. This one is, but. Yeah, I believe my understanding is, is that he is going to hire uh, someone to do it like it's been traditionally done as opposed to taking it on himself. Okay, so some of your other uh, colleagues, other DAs in other jurisdictions, uh, the, if the coroners there are qualified, do they perform it themselves or it's still they tend to hire outside? I don't, I don't know about those jurisdictions. Tradition, most coroner's offices in this state do not have a certified pathologist performing their own pathology work in autopsies. Okay, and then my, my last question on that, uh, back to the SANE program we were discussing. Does the DA's office have, how in quickly do you get involved with uh, the allegation of assault or rape? And is, depends. is there, so is there logistically? So it depends on the extent of the, of the case, whether it's a full-on, uh, whether it's a forcible rape, aggravated rape, um, sexual battery, you know, the, the, the degree and the facts, the particular facts drive the offense, which drives the penalty. Um, if it's an aggravated rape, then we have a mandated protocol with all law enforcement agencies that trigger our involvement within two weeks of arrest. We also allow our office to be utilized again as a consultation um, and or uh, participate at times when necessary in the investigative part uh, of those cases. Um, no later than two weeks post arrest for major sex crimes. Now, is, is there any negative impact to your ability to conduct uh, investigations that it has been we now have a cooperative agreement in, with Jefferson as opposed to having, d doing it in-house? The, the agreements don't impact me as long as the personnel is available to do the job. I think it affects the, the people who are willing to do the job uh, depending on the amount of pay, um, whether they're coming from across the lake or whether they live in our own community. Um, the SANE nursing uh, program I think is critically important because these people have specialized training in how to communicate with uh, victims and for purposes for us, it's also down the road quasi-evidence collection, right? So just like any, uh, anything else in particular, um, you know, I don't want to have a narcotics detective uh, communicating with a child sex victim. I don't need an ER doctor communicating with the same. It's a different type of specialty. It's a different type of training. And just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you're uniquely qualified to walk through the dialogue that's necessary for victims. So I think the same program is critically important. You have anything to add to that? I would just say, you know, I've had cases where a, an ER nurse has done the collection for a rape kit. Um, and it is very different than when you have a SANE nurse performing that because the SANE nurses are trained to document exactly where they're taking specific swabs from, which can become very critical when you are going to trial. Um, it can become a dispute as far as where a swab was specifically taken. And if each of the swabs are not documented accurately, then it can become an issue as far as where exactly was that taken. Could that just be an accidental deposit of DNA? Um, those issues do become heavily relevant when you go to trial, and so it is really important to have a qualified person doing that collection and documentation. So under the new, I don't want to say, re well, current regime, or now the, the cooperative agreement, do you have less access to a sane, qualified person because we're now using Jefferson? I don't think so. Okay. 
is, is, is again, as long as the, the employment is attractive to the people who have the certification and qualification, if the rate of pay is less, which I understand that it is, um, then that could diminish at some point in time, right? So as long as the, the people who are qualified continue to want to do their job, we're not impacted. I don't, regardless of who administers it, the training is going to dictate evidence collection and communication and questioning. And then the last part is, is that the people who, if you have people that are trained to do this regularly in a regular communication with us, they know the protocols, they know the questions, they know the preparation, they know the suppression issues because they've either dealt with them or had to testify for us. So they're far more trained to also testify, understanding the different exceptions that allow that evidence in and not falling afoul of doing things that they shouldn't do, which could bar us from using the materials at all. I guess, yeah, in my bottom line, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I just want to make sure I understand, is is the change to the new way of doing it, so you, it is not impacting It'll have zero impact on us as long okay. as there are people who want to do the job for the way that it's structured and what's being offered. Okay, thanks. Uh, when you yeah. mentioned, I guess it's through the Cooperative Endeavor, that With the who? other uh, parishes are picking up some of the, some of the funding. What was that for? What was that for? Oh, opioid initiative. There was a, there were opioid, there was lawsuits across the state. Uh -huh. uh, there was a, a massive settlement, and each sheriff's office obtained an X amount of money of a settlement against Big Pharma for opioid litigation. Sheriffs got their monies, and then the rest of the uh, monies in each parish had to be split amongst uh, multiple stakeholders that were participants in the litigation. And so we meet with uh, President Cooper's office and, a, and council and various other uh, stakeholders, fire departments, uh, hospitals, and okay, yeah. a lot of people. And so everyone kind of puts in um, what they would like to see for their respective agencies. Some need equipment, Narcan, uh, training, education, <coughs> For our component, we're looking at, uh, in addition, I didn't mention this, but targeting hot spots in areas where there are a lot of overdoses and then trying to share that information with law enforcement to target certain locations that seem to be hot spot activities. And as we have defendants that are operating those activities, we begin to flag those cases in our system uh, to handle different defendants differently, okay, uh, depending on who they're communicating with, where they're operating, and using all that data and collecting it, especially in the overdose scenario with uh, forms of communication with victims before they die, all that's now being collected to be a research tool and law enforcement support tool. No, I'm familiar with that, but I, I thought you had mentioned something where... Yeah, it's an agreement with the parish that we get those funds to pay for the employee uh, that's staffed to handle that, and we have an agreement between Washington Parish for their, their funds, a portion of their funds, and with St. Tammany for a portion of their funds. And then when I marry that up with uh, the federal overtime monies, there should be, once everything's running the right way, zero regular general fund impact to both the parish and the DA's office for that employee. Okay, thank and, you. and if I can add to, I yeah. think one of the things that Mr. Sims touched on with regard to other agencies picking up the costs, our office had received a grant from the LDAA for a very specific software called Nighthawk. And we, um, so I was given a license through the LDAA for this very specific software that is extremely beneficial for complex cases, whether they be homicide, drugs. And as we were looking at this software, we realized it would be really beneficial for our opioid initiative. However, that first license was given to us by a grant and it is very expensive to get that. So when we had this investigator assigned to all these different jurisdictions working with Tangi and JP and all these other um, jurisdictions who are collaborating to try and make progress, they decided that they wanted to utilize this software as well because they saw the benefits of it. And so they agreed that the uh, investigator from our office who is task force with them, they would give him a license through their agency because his work is benefit benefiting both their agency and our agency. Right. So we are able to reap the benefits of their um, their cost with regard to this software. Right, that, that was what I was leading up to. How, how much does that save you? So the license, I believe, um, you know, it, it depends on how many people are getting it, but just for one, I believe it's about $3,500. But then a, uh, you also have to pay for the training, and so that's an additional $3,000, and then if you want the advanced training, that's an additional $3,000. 
So the more that you begin to utilize that software, you know, the more savings that it is to us. I mean, it's thousands of dollars. Thank you. And a separate mm -hmm. comment is that we actually have two individuals uh, task forced with DEA. The other one is another gentleman, and his him being embedded with a DEA group has also uh, produced approximately four hundred thousand dollars in asset forfeiture dollars uh, to us, even though the monies were seized in another parish. So it's, it, it's substantial, then, what you're saying. It can be, as long as it's done right. Okay. All right, Mr. Infestado, then Mr. Corbin, then me. I think you may have covered most of it, but the OD deaths, you said that was 120? So last year it was 116. 116. Previous year was like 120 or something like that. And that investigator investigates those deaths exclusively? No. So what he does is, is that he embeds with and participates in the investigative phase and support phase with the different agencies who submitted the case. So one of the examples that I, that I give that kind of started the whole thing is that Slidell PD was working a case. Um, it was an overdose case, but it came to us as a distribution of heroin, okay? So in reading the report, accidentally, for a distribution of heroin, I learned that we documented a homicide. And the homicide was documented because the person overdosed and died. Um, and the bad guy went back to the mom's house and gave her cash to pay for her son's funeral. Uh, she called 911, and then when the guy came over at some point in time, she said, well, that's the guy who was selling drugs to my son uh, and killed him. And so they did a bunch, a series of controlled buys um, from the guy and submitted the case to us as a uh, distribution. And so we had a meeting about it and said, hey, why are we not working this as a homicide? And their response was, well, you take it as a homicide because a lot of DA's offices will not. And sometimes the toxicology can be hard to marry up and there's some hurdles. Uh, but so we developed a protocol about consulting on those cases with the law enforcement agency with us at the outset and then we collaborate kind of moving forward once they were notified of the overdose death and some of the uh, particulars of it. We weren't going to work everyone because it would overwhelm all the different agencies and the, the particularized facts starting out with first the ones that, that pretend to be something else, right, where you're actually, um, I won't say defrauding, but making the addict think that he's getting oxy, oxycodone, oxycontin, um, what are the other pills? Um, some other pills that they're, they're pressing to make it look like the actual prescription when it's a knockoff laced with fentanyl. Um, anyway, so that particular case, we worked it. We did a lot of warrants and assisted them in getting historical cell site location information. We put bad guy down at the address the night before. He had lied to law enforcement, said he had, he had not been there in like a month. So there were a series of things that helped us build it collaboratively. So our, our role in that is primarily a support role, but also an initial evidence, collect, not evidence collection, but phone dumping role, um, getting the communication information, which most of this is um, historical location and communication information. So a support role with the agencies we have a relationship with who've expressed an interest in partnering with us to do that. So we don't do it alone, we do it with them. The part that we are doing for them as a service is collecting all the communication information of victims who are overdosing and dying and making it available to law enforcement so that when they stop people or they have regular drug cases and they want to look at that communication between the drug dealer and drug user, then you marry those communications up to say, I wonder if he's been in recent communication with someone who's died. And so as you collect that and build that database over time and you do different drug cases in the future and you re-reference that back, that's going to trigger you how you handle that particular person. Is he just a drug user? Is he just a small-time drug dealer? If he's responsible for providing things that are referenced as killing someone, then you trigger your resources and handle them targetedly differently. And the current funding you have for that is satisfactory? No, but it's, it's, it's satisfactory for where we are at this stage. Okay, as we're building it out, but as the as you start, you know, th a little too thin in in how many cases are being successfully worked, that's going to build the interest, and then we'll be working a larger percentage of the 120. As you do that, that becomes that's a different. All of it will be data driven. So if if I say something's changed, I'll show you the data that says this is why this has changed. 
this is why this amount of investment is no longer satisfactory because we were doing this now we're doing this so anything that I ask you for I'll show you what we've done um, to the extent that I can um, if that's fair mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you um, Chairman Laughlin uh, I only have a couple questions um, Colin on the can you can you just very succinctly describe the warrant process what a warrant is I don't mean like giving I mean ha relative to staffing right if you can so we have that 30 then, go we ahead. have 30 warrants that are regular warrants assigned to the entire 22nd JDC uh, each warrant is worth fifty thousand dollars the warrant can only be spent on a portion of a prosecutor's salary or an ADA's salary um, we have 30 warrants we've had 30 warrants for almost 17 years um, so it's been the same number of warrants provided to us from the state of Louisiana uh, for 17 years without an increase in the number of warrants the value of each warrant has gone up over time um, incrementally but the number of total warrants associated and assigned to our office and our our jurisdiction has not increased and so anything that you're going to do above $50,000 has to be supplemented by uh, other funding, right? So your benefits, your health care, all of that has to be uh, separately funded, our contribution to the retirement system. Uh, so if you don't have any dollars or funds to marry up to a warrant, um, which was if we were to find ourselves in the, in the, uh, in the position uh, that was originally submitted, you may have seen us returning money uh, to the state of Louisiana because if we don't have sufficient funds to marry up to the warrant it, it's a cask it's it's a you're hurting yourself twice because now I can't marry any of the funds to the warrant I can't use the warrant and now I find myself returning fifty thousand dollars to the state so the the potential cut to the district attorney's office of 55 percent would have had a a larger cut because it would have caused us not to be able to utilize state funding and us just returning money to the state of Louisiana if we couldn't pay for at least 30 ADAs. And you, I, I can't remember the date. I know you just said it a second ago for yes, when. Sir. How long have they been that way? 30 years, roughly? We've had 30? You've had 30 17. for 17 years. 17 years. What would be a prudent, a realistic number? Not blue sky, but what, what, where, where do you think, what's your assessment where we should be right now? I think the proper number would be in the neighborhood of 40. Okay. Uh, 40 to 40, I know this sounds silly, but... 42 um, and honestly if you look at other parishes like Orleans that has 90 uh, Jefferson that has I think in the mid 50s to almost 60 something something like that maybe it's a little less uh, in that neighborhood the difference between uh, I know I've mentioned this in many uh, meetings um, between us and Jefferson Parish in years that I've checked and the number of defendants charged with felonies is a difference of 15 percent more uh, in Jefferson Parish um, there have been years where we've had the same number of jury trials as almost Jefferson and St. Tammany Parish. So to have the type of growth that we've had in this, uh, in this parish and not have uh, the warrants keep up and keep pace with that um, has put a greater strain on you, the parish, to further supplement our funding. And just to just kind of play this out to the end, so if, you, if those warrants are worth 50,000 each, it's roughly 500,000 if we went to, let's say we went to 40. What are the what's the other overhead or come along costs that have to be brought with that? You have to bring up the salaries. So I'd assume that for so, uh, so let's say a, just, just a second if I could finish. Sure. I, I would assume that that's going to almost double to a million, and then you got support staff that might go with it. So you have five hundred thousand dollars that comes from the state. We get five hundred thousand dollars that I'm looking at like downstream in the 27, 28, 29 time frame when our future budgets. You might come back and say, hey, we got our additional warrants. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand what what other costs would be associated with the state giving us an additional $500,000. Is it another million? Is it $750,000 to complement that $500,000? Depends. They've also changed the rules with warrants where you can split and stack them now. Okay. So, you know, depending on the programs that we're running, the staffing needs at the time, um, I may have a, have a scenario where for some reason we become investigator needed heavy, or that's the area to expand uh, more than ADAs for some reason at that given time. Um, then I can stack a warrant and pay $100,000 of an ADA salary as opposed to 50. Now I'm asking you for less money. Right. Um, in those examples, in those instances, um, or I can split them and then supplement even greater and have, uh, you know, the other 10 warrants supplement 
the 30 that I have to a greater extent of total salary asking you for less money. But if we continue to expand out as the book of business increases, then it'll be, you know, for a five um, to seven year uh, ADA who is a experienced litigator, you're going to start paying between 80 and $100,000 a year just in salary. Um, we now have gone from a 0% contribution, I don't know what the future looks like, to a, what is it, 12.25% 12, 12 contribution in retirement. Our health care seems to be almost doubling. So anything you marry up from a benefit standpoint to the salary is what you'd have to ask for if, I'm, if I used one warrant to each ADA. So, right. uh, if, if I can, so your benefits sure. are probably, what, 35%? 35 to 40% if you, okay. That's probably what they're averaging now. So I'll everyone. refer to Jennifer on that. Yeah, I, I, I like to work in raw, rough order magnitude numbers is all I'm looking for. We had five hundred thousand. If you get five hundred thousand dollars, assume those are ten positions. Can we expect is that? And assuming they're each individual positions, is that another five hundred thousand or another million that has to come along? I think the easiest the way to do it is to take the uh, take all the attorneys category, and by the percentage increase to the total number of warrants you receive, increase your salaries and benefits respective to the number of employees that are ADAs that have a warrant. Okay. Jennifer, can you give me just a round number? Well, I don't think, I mean, right now we, we have 47 ADAs. Okay. I just don't have enough warrants for them. So let's say we added 10 more. So I if, mean, I, assume if that, I get more warrants. I if, assume the reason you'd want more warrants is, one, to help offset the cost and free up some money. But I would assume that I've been listening to you historically, my, my assumption has been, and it could be completely wrong, so yeah. I'd like you to correct me if it is, is that because of the growth that you really want more, you want more staff, not it's 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 adding additional staff, not just offsetting costs. It's if that's things. if that's incorrect, I'd like you to correct me well, now. It's not so incorrect. It's just it's not just that simple. It's not just an answer. So right now, traditionally, this DA's office ten years ago operated with there is a group of attorneys out there that are experienced, waiting and praying to come work in St. Tammany Parish as a prosecutor. Well, they're not getting experience in traditional venues any longer, and so ourselves in Jefferson find ourselves training our own where Orleans used to be the charity hospital of litigation, that training's gone. Mm -hmm. So now we're training our own. So we need to hire entry level ADAs that are getting ready for the next person who's got 10 years of litigation experience that I can't pay 200 grand to and wants to leave, next man up, which requires overlapping that I don't have. Right. So traditionally we've been stuck over the last four or five years I have the ADAs that are assigned the immediate book of business in front of them. I have no one in training unless I go grab them and poach them from another office, which we have been doing. Okay. So if you want to begin to train your own and have your next group in a normal planning model where you have different experience levels, you understand your normal attrition rate and factor all of that in, then I need to be able to do that. Okay. Uh, what I'm trying to understand, uh, I'll, be, I'll be cut to the chase, maybe Jennifer, you can just send me a note and answer it. Sure. At some point in time, you're going to have you're going to have cost increases above and beyond inflation. I'm just trying to get a sense of what that future liability might be if you're successful. You've talked extensively in meetings that yep. I've been in about the need for more warrants. I don't assume those warrants are are just going to be to offset salary today. No. That you've got a bigger picture than that. So I'm just trying to understand. Get just get a sense. Are we looking at another million dollars in? in Two or three years? We're looking at five million dollars in two more in two three years. That's, that's all. I, right. And he's talking about both because we do have we do have ADAs without warrants right yeah, now. Yeah, I understand that. So it, it's both. It's to offset, but to add more. So it's so it's a mix of the two. What should we be thinking about in terms of future liability? Super for, simple. Take the number of ADAs. Take the salaries and benefits associated with them beyond the warrant. Take the percentage that we're looking for by way of new. If I say it's if we have thirty and forty is the number, whatever that percentage increase is and take the salaries and benefits that are over $50,000 in that range of employee, and that'll give you the number. Hey, Jennifer, can you get us that? Sure. Thanks. It's All probably right. about um, 100000 so, per... I can't calculate it as I sit here. You mentioned uh, asset for forfeiture? Yes, sir. Okay, guys, mics are Hi. Don't forget. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah. um, asset forfeiture. How much do y'all get usually for, just out of curiosity? You just looked at it. It, it fluctuates from year to year. Um, and, and you're talking if you're talking federal or state last year federally like you said the program he was talking about the seizure that came in was three hundred thousand dollars and that, is that that's that doesn't happen every year yeah um and usually last year we brought in a hundred thousand like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the state level 
that could go next year we might get bring in twenty thousand dollars it all depends on what gets st seized out there on i-12 when that happens I mean, that's so do they give you the physical assets or do they just liquidate them and give you the cash it depends like the, depends. what's what's taken like cars are sold liquidated or repurposed by law enforcement there's a limited purpose to the assets and what they could be utilized for right now we're we've only taken cash DA uh, Sims uh, so in in December because we did something like this with the uh, highway 90 bridges recently we passed a resolution just a, a resolution for us as you know is, is a sense of the council's position on something and actually it actually got a lot of traction that particular resolution would you I'd, I'd be interested possibly in December introducing a resolution to request additional warrants because we know we've been talking about this for over a year sure and it will at least get some ideally some attention to it uh, and we, but I, I guess my number, my question for you, first off, is that something you'd be interested in? And second, how, what is the number you, that you believe is justified? I think 40 warrants is a, is a, is a reasonable number of warrants. Uh, you know, we'll be competing with other offices uh, to get additional warrants uh, next year. Um, we've been in communication with the reps and going through the process. The LDAA is starting to put together a little primer to educate all the representatives so we can make a pitch there is a process to all of it okay so you think 40 would be justified mm -hmm. well 42 would be great but I think 40 is is, is sufficient okay all yeah. right looking to Murray looking to Murray they got one more take us home Rick in that diversion program what are those uh, funds that you all get from that what 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 are they restricted to uh, you can't make money from the program, so you have to cost allocate uh, the monies that come in from the program to the expenses of doing it, employees' time and handling and managing uh, the different third-party uh, uh, programs that, and track them, uh, call them and communicate for drug testing purposes. So okay. you have case managers assigned to uh, the department and the staff. It's not a money-making program, gotcha. so it can't, DA's offices have gotten trouble for making money off of diversion. Okay, understood. Thank you. I do have one last thing I'd bring up. Yep. So I think we are we have sent at least a draft of it. We are going to ask that the current MOU or CEA that's in place with us now on uh, how the monies are funded to the DA's office uh, be amended. So the CEA that's in place, so not talking about the long-term CEA, um, but the uh, CEA that was signed in 2000 and what was that roughly? 20, 17. 2017. 2017. When we transferred the salaries and benefits, the payroll to us. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're going to ask that ultimately that be amended so that we get a, a 12th of our budget at the beginning of each month uh, sent over by electronic transmission. And then quarterly, we will provide data on how we're spending the money in whichever format you guys find most efficient to show you how we're spending the money. It also asks that we can transfer between line items, any yep. and all line items. Um, is to update the procedures. Yes. Yes. And to yes. Put yep. it in place before. Correct. How the money's handled. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Our and the budgets. Right now, we're on reimbursables. Okay. You can send that to us. I think we just sent it to Mary. Yeah. I thought I'd already okay. sent it, but Mary I hadn't sent it yet. Mary's got it. Mary okay. It right if Mary so has it, we're safe. And what we've sent it will be the current with the proposed change for the paragraphs that we are proposing to amend. Okay. And then Mary, just for technical, that would go through the administration, then back to us. Okay. All right, looking to my left, last chance, looking to my administration. We're good. Guys, thank you so much for yep. coming. We appreciate it. Great job. Thank you.